Let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 2 this morning. Luke chapter 2, and I want you to follow with me as I read the first 14 verses of Luke's gospel. Chapter 2. Luke 2, 1, and it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be registered. This census first took place while Quirinius was governing Syria, and so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee out of the city of Nazareth into Judea to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were completed for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone round them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people, for there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. You know, this Christmas Eve and maybe Christmas morning as you're gathered with your family and you are getting started with the day, I encourage you to open up to this passage of Scripture and just read it together as a family. Just read it, have a short word of prayer, and then... Have your exciting day of making a mess around your house. (laughs) All the food, the presents. But it will do so much to get you focused on what Christmas is about. Even maybe some any one of your kids that's old enough to read could read this. It's it's just great to hear a young child read this passage out loud. It sounds fresh. And maybe you parents you feel like, oh, you you don't want to be on the spot. Well, you are on the spot, and your kids are watching you, wondering what Christmas is all about. Just takes a few seconds to read this, pray, and then have a great day together. Well, this week, a big story in the news. Google announced the top 10 searches for 2014. Did you catch that story? It was interesting. I thought, well, that's interesting, and it passed along, and, and, uh, but it kept coming up in the news a few times. Now, consider how many searches go on through the year on Google. A few hundred, I'm sure. Millions, billions, trillions. Trillions of searches. And Google has told us, what people are searching for. And the more I thought about this, I thought how perfect this was because people are people. Whether it is our time or the time that Jesus was born, the Son of God was born into the world. Here are the top 10 searches. No, this is not a David Letterman list. Fascinating, the number one search for this year, Robin Williams. Searching about his career and maybe about what might have led up to his suicide. Something was missing in his life. Number two, World Cup soccer. 
Three, Ebola. These are just up and down. Number four, the disappearance of the Malaysia Airlines. Five, Flappy Bird. (laughs) The number five search for all of 2014 was Flappy Bird. Now, who knows what Flappy Bird is? Are you embarrassed to raise your hand? I had to Google it (laughs) to find out what Flappy Bird was. What? I added to that number. That's why it's on the list, because I had to search for Flappy Bird. It's a video game, and that's why I don't know what it is, because I have better things to do with my life, like clean the bathroom or something. Number six, are you ready? The ALS Ice Bucket Challenge. I missed that one. Number seven, from Ice Bucket Challenge to number seven, ISIS. Number eight, Ferguson. If you're not watching, that means that was about the shooting of the young boy by the police officer in Ferguson, the trial of the police officer, and then the protests, which are still going on. Number nine, Frozen. There is an ice theme in this search. And number 10, drum roll, I should have Andy up here. Where's Andy? Number 10, the Ukraine invasion by Russia. This is up and down. It's exciting and then it's scary. It's a video game and then it's terrorism. But those are the top 10 searches. And I I was just curious, not only what they were, but how they were relevant to people's lives. And I wrote out these 10 things and I thought, what's, what's the common thread here of these 10 searches of people? Well, it seemed to me that they all fell into three categories. One, entertainment, entertainment. Two, terrorism or war, and three, disease. Entertainment, war, or disease. In other words, people are searching for peace. That's the overarching theme, whether people are afraid of terrorism, what happened to the missing plane, or whether it is entertainment, which is an escape from life. To me, there is a touch of each of these things of people are looking for peace. People are looking for answers. The year that Jesus was born, the top search was? I looked this up on Google. Where was he born? As you read through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the top search was, where is he? Where was Jesus born? You go through the story, Mary and Joseph. Now, they knew where they had to go, but they didn't really want to go to Bethlehem. They didn't plan on traveling there when she was pregnant. But the prophet Micah said, that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem. Micah 5, 2. It was predicted, and Mary knew and Joseph knew that she was carrying the Savior of the world. But the Bible said he must be born in Bethlehem. The governor issues a decree. The decree would happen about every, oh, I don't remember, I think it was 10 or 15 years that everyone would have to be registered, which was for taxation. And everyone had to travel back to the, the hometown of their ancestry. Mary and Joseph were ancestors of David, and the Bible said that the Messiah would be a descendant of David. And it's interesting that both Mary and Joseph were descendants of King David. The search that was Significant to them was not where he would be born, but where they would stay when they got to Bethlehem. Because you see, 
All the hotels were full. Expedia couldn't help them. Everything was full, and so the only place was to, to have this baby in a manger, a stall, a barn where animals would be laid. The shepherds were searching. The angels said to them, do not be afraid, for behold, I bring, bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people, not just Israel. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes lying in a manger. That would be a sign or a, a, a significant indicator because no mother would ever lay their child in a manger. An unclean place. The shepherd said, let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Then they returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Just exactly as it was told them. There were the wise men who came searching. The wise men, or the magi, they were men who were known for their skill in watching the stars. And somehow they knew that there would be a star that would lead them to the birth of the Savior, the King of Israel. They followed his star to Jerusalem. They asked Herod, who felt that he was the king of the Jews, where he would be born. And they said, we have come to worship him. And Matthew's gospel says that Herod was troubled, and because Herod was troubled, all Jerusalem was troubled because it threatened his sense of security and control and his identity. Herod asked the Jews where the Messiah was to be born because they would have known the scriptures. They said Bethlehem, and Bethlehem was about five miles outside of Jerusalem. And Herod says to the wise men, you go and find him, and when you find him, come back and tell me because I want to go too and worship him, which was a complete lie. Herod asked the Jews, or asked the wise men when they first saw the star, and it was after that that Herod ordered all the male children killed two years old and under because it seemed that it had been about two years since they first saw the star in the east that led them to Jerusalem. All those who received the news of the birth of Jesus experienced great joy. It was those who didn't want to hear the news that were troubled. Mary and Joseph, although it was, wasn't convenient for them, they rejoiced. They knew that they had a unique, special mission of bringing the Son of God into the world. The Magi, who were not even Jewish, it's possible they were Persian or from Iraq. It's interesting. Several years ago, I met, met a man from Iraq, and we were talking. It was about Christmas time. And uh, I asked him if he celebrated Christmas, and he said, he said, commercially. And I said, well, do you know about the birth of Jesus and about the wise men? He goes, no. I said, well, they were from your country. They were from Iraq, from Persia. And I connected that and just told him about the Lord in that year. It was about 10 years ago. But why would these wise men from Persia know about a prophecy of a star that would announce the birth of the Savior of the world? It's likely that when the Jews were in Babylonian captivity, that they were teaching the scriptures, especially Daniel, 
knew the scriptures. It was the Babylonians. Then the Persians came in and conquered Babylon. And there in, the, in that part of the world, the Jews told others about the predictions of the coming Savior of the world. I'm curious, even thinking about the top Google searches of the year, what are your top searches? Do you guys get on your laptops, your iPads in front of the TV and search? I find that when I do, thanks Kim, when I do, I tend to, I just focus on the same things. Kim just threw Caesar under the bus. She said he does. Do you get on eBay and search? Is there some video game or a plate that you have to have? Do you collect something? See, I would never do this. Guitar gear. If you're into something, there's always new information or you've got to find a deal on it, right? Right? The top searches. And we kind of do it to fill time, to veg out, to check out. But it's interesting that no matter how much I find exactly what I was looking for, I'll find the, the deal of the century on a piece of guitar equipment that I was looking for. As soon as I get it, you just wait for the brown truck to pull up in front of your house. The other day, the UPS truck went up and down my street four times. And I thought his day would be a whole lot shorter if it would be one time. And the truck comes and the bot comes and my wife says, did you order something? Oh, no, honey. It's for the church. (laughs) I'm sure it's books for the church. It usually is, but if... I get a pedal or something that comes in the mail. It's like, I, I'm just, you just wait. You just count down the days. This thing is going to show up at my house, and I'm going to un- unbox it. I'm going to plug it in, and I will suddenly be an amazing guitar player when I have this pedal. Right, Brandon? Where are you, Brandon? He left. And then I plug it in, and then I go... Oh, it's not quite right. Yeah, I'm, I'm talking about you, Brandon. He's out there. Then, then there is the, there's this anticipation, the excitement of getting it, and then the letdown. Oh, that's exactly what I wanted. But, but I need another one to match it. I put the plate on the shelf, and oh, but it looks funny there by itself. I need the rest of them. No matter how much we search, the search is exciting, but it's not quite satisfying, is it? Not that there's anything wrong with our shopping and our searches, but this search, this event of finding Jesus would be different from any other search. Because with this search, was the announcement, the promise of peace. Not a disappointment. Not I'll try Jesus out, then I'll go on. But this would be the search, the finding, the delivery that really would bring peace into our lives. Now when the angels announced to the shepherd there would be peace, They weren't saying that now that Jesus is born, there would be peace forever on the earth. They were saying that to anyone who would receive him, there would be peace. For you who would receive him, there would be peace. For the shepherds who went out of their way to find him, they would have peace. And they did, and they rejoiced, and they told everyone what they had found. It's fascinating that the angels announced to the shepherds the birth of the Son of God. Shepherds were the lowest of society. They weren't anybody important. They weren't anybody important. 
what might be special about these shepherds is that in the temple there in Jerusalem, they sacrifice lambs every day in offerings. And it's possible that these shepherds were temple shepherds. That their job was to raise lambs, spotless lambs, for the sacrifice in the temple daily. These lowly, unimportant shepherds, they're not spiritual leaders, they're not priests, they're not anybody special, but the angels announce to them. And I like how the Lord announces to us unimportant people what he is doing. And he leaves out the important people. The shepherds would appreciate the news. But even the Jewish leaders, when Herod questions the Jewish leaders and said, well, you should know where the birth of the Messiah would be. You know, it would have been nothing for them to travel five miles from Jerusalem to Bethlehem to just see if this was true. And they didn't do it. They couldn't take the time to find out if the wise men were actually wise men, if they knew what they were talking about. But the promise of the angels to the shepherds, peace on earth, that you would have peace. Now, there was a type of peace in the world at that time. Under Rome and under the fierce control and threat of Rome, there had not been war for many years. But it was a, an imitation peace. It wasn't real peace. And people might have said, well, there is peace on earth. Rome's got everything in control. But it was a fear of Rome. A fear of Rome. The Bible teaches real peace to the individual who receives Jesus Christ into their hearts. In fact, the Bible teaches two kinds of peace I want to tell you about this morning. Two types of peace that come through Jesus Christ. Number one is that we can have peace with God. Peace with God. Why? Because the Bible says that every person born into the world is separated from God and actually against God. Now, people say, I'm not against God. Well, are you following God? Are you keeping his word? Jesus says, you are either for me or you're against me. Paul said in Ephesians 2, that we all once conducted ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind, and were by nature, by nature, children of wrath, just as others. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses and sins, made us alive together with Christ. Ephesians 2, 14, Paul says that he himself, meaning Christ, is our peace. He has the one he is the one who came in as the mediator between you and God to establish peace, to restore the relationship. And speaking about the Jew and the Gentile, the Jews felt that they didn't need to be forgiven of their sins. The Gentiles felt that there is no way that they would have, ever have access to God. And Paul says in Ephesians 2.18 that through him... We both have access by one spirit to the Father. Peace with God. Peace with God. That's interesting how many people, if you ask them if they believe in Jesus or if they're religious, they say, yes, I'm a spiritual person. And the Bible says that if they are not following after the Lord, God says, you're against me. Even Jesus would say when he comes into the world in Matthew 25 that, that many will say, Lord, Lord. Many will say, well, we did this for you. We, we 
cast out demons. We did all these great works. And Jesus says, but you weren't really following after me. You were being religious, yes. You were following some program. But you weren't doing it as unto me. So peace with God is the first order of business. And out of that, secondly, comes to have the peace of God. Peace of God. Because you see, outside of a relationship with God, something is missing. Something spiritually is missing that can only be satisfied by a relationship with God. Once we've been restored to that relationship, then we can have this satisfying peace. Now I can come to God. The Bible says that before I even have a relationship with God, I have no right to come to God and ask Him for my needs. I don't have a relationship. I am in opposition to God. But once the relationship is established, the Bible says, now you become a partaker of the divine things. You have access to the very promises of God, the throne room of God. Whether you're rich or poor, a shepherd, somebody important, it is through Jesus Christ that you have peace with God, and then you can have the peace of God. Paul said in Philippians 4, be anxious for nothing. But in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Isaiah the prophet said, You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you. You will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on you. Both of these scriptures, Philippians and Isaiah 26, both speak of the peace that comes to us because we have access to God through prayer. We have access to God through prayer. Now, I don't know about you, but I have so many things that come up through the year that take away my peace. Worry about Ebola. <laughs> no, you just worry. It's just family, the normal family things or health concerns or something that is on my mind about the church. And, you know, it's just so easy to say, oh, just trust the Lord. If somebody just said that to you this year, something comes up and they just say, oh, brother, just trust the Lord. And what do you want to do? Just punch him. That's right, Jeremy. Just, just, just say, shut up. Oh, sister, just trust the Lord. And I have found over and over again, not only the, the big and the small things that rob me of peace, but the constant access that I have to God, that every time I, I come to God in prayer and say, Lord, Lord, I, I just need help with this. I need strength to deal with this. The Lord gives me peace. I'll wake up in the middle of the night or the first thing in the morning. I'm not even trying to worry about something. I just, my eyes open and there it is. It's right on my mind. Is coffee made? I mean, these are important questions. I confess how, how fragile that, you know, I can even be, I'll be, you know, it's, it's more of a physical anxiety sometimes, and I realize I just need to eat something. I need, I need coffee. I need a big cinnamon roll. This would fix many things. Honestly, I just feel this year has been 
just a daily, daily effort to trust the Lord for peace. And the thing is, you pray one day for that peace and you have it through the day. You experience the peace of God that passes understanding. And then the next day you wake up with the same anxiety. And you might think, well, Lord, I prayed and you gave me peace. Why am I worried today? And you might experience this day after day. You're going through the day even and you have peace. And suddenly a a fear, a thought comes to your mind. And it just throws you into a terror. Is that right? Peter says, to cast your cares on him, for he cares for you. And the word for casting your cares on the Lord is not a one-time give it to the Lord. Or if I give it to the Lord in the right way, then I'll never be worried about that again. It's more like playing catch. It is casting it on the Lord, and there it comes back. Not that he gave you your fears back, but it comes back to you, and you just cast. And you know what what happens when you play catch with your father? You grow close. And through the constant need to be casting your cares on the Lord every day, suddenly you'll notice how strong your relationship with the Lord is. You're growing. And what has developed in your life but prayer? This quickness to say, God, are you with me? God, what do you want to do? Lord, what are we doing today? Paul talked about being constant. I think it was Paul. Being constant in prayer. Praying constantly. You have this privilege. You have this kind of relationship, this access to God that has purely come through Jesus Christ giving you peace with God and then peace, the peace of God. Not peace on earth as in in no war ever again, But among all those who would receive him, there is peace. There is peace. Especially at this time of year, there is this anxiety that comes up. Worship team, you can come up now as we get ready to close. And invariably, as December is approaching in the year and people know that I'm a pastor, they'll go, oh, I bet bet this is a busy time of year for you. And the interesting thing is that as a pastor, my life at the church, my schedule at the church doesn't get busier, it just gets more stressful. And do you know why? Because you are more stressed out. So knock it off. (laughs) Just trust the Lord. All of a sudden, we're worried about all the things that come with Christmas. I want to encourage you this Christmas that Jesus Christ gives you peace, the peace with God and the peace of God that nothing else, nothing else can replace. I find that the older that I get, the the fewer and fewer presents I want for Christmas. Theoretically, if you've already bought something, I'm willing to minister to you and receive it. (laughs) But just to make it about the Lord. Make it about the Lord. Amen? Amen. Lord, today we rejoice in you. We, We thank you and praise you for the peace that you've given to us, Lord. And for any of us who are worried and not experiencing that peace, Lord, may today be a a renewing, a coming back home, back to that place of letting you be our peace, giving us the gift of peace. Lord, we thank you. 
And just pray your blessing on every family, every person, as we celebrate your birth together. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.